I'd like to, to keep this in mind for our, our explorations today. Uh, this photo was taken by Max Zubaznia uh, on February 20th, 1993, 19 years and about two weeks ago, in Yerevan's Liberty Square, where thousands and thousands of Armenians came out in the cold, snowy weather to stand shoulder to shoulder and commemorate the fifth anniversary of the Artsakh movement, the beginnings of the Artsakh liberation movement. They stood proud and unified in Yerevan in solidarity with the selfless and courageous men and women who fought on the front lines, supporting those that secured Lachin, those that liberated Shushi, and those that never, ever surrendered Shaomyan. They stood in support of the volunteer, the volunteer brigades that formed the core of the foundations of Artsakh's military. They stood together, defiantly valiant, following the massacres at Sungait, Baku, and Kirovaba. And like this generation that stood together, our generation stands together in support of freedom, security, and prosperity for the people of Artsakh. In September of 2010, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation's Bureau published a position paper entitled Towards a Fair and Just Resolution, the Mountainous Karabakh Conflict. Uh, in this document, which is publicly available online, the region's historical roots, as well as its so, uh, Sovietization, are discussed. The Karabakh movement is outlined from referendum votes to military operations. The peace process is discussed from the ceasefire and mediation with the Commonwealth of Independent States to the OSCE's Minsk Group, where ongoing negotiations take place today. Most importantly, the document clearly articulates that Artsakh is an integral part of Armenia and that the will of the Armenian people, the will of the people of Artsakh, has been made clear by referendum votes in 1991 and again in 2006. Furthermore, it states that a final settlement of the conflict must include Gharapah as a full-fledged party to any peace negotiations. Today, Gharapah grows as a developing democratic state and recognition of its sovereignty is the only means of attaining regional stability, lasting peace, and political and economic development for the entire South Caucasus. The Dashnaktsutun as a political party and community organization has prioritized the liberation of Artsakh as a fundamental virtue from the beginning days of the self-defense movement until today in its socioeconomic development. Our role as a diaspora must be to continue the support to ensure Artsakh's security from external Azadi aggression and the inevitable reunification with our homeland. Our first panel today is entitled The Ongoing Quest for Self-Determination and Impact on Future Generations. We have two wonderful panelists, Anthony Kasparian and Alina Dorian. Let's invite you up. Dr. Anthony Kasparian serves as the executive director of the New York-based Tufankian Foundation, supervising projects in Armenia and nagorno karabakh that focus on social protection, environmental advocacy, sustainable development, and various strategic issues. In 2003, he initiated the foundation's Karabakh program, which primarily supports those living in the enclave's border regions. Dr. Kasparian holds a PhD in geography from Rutgers University. His doctoral dissertation is entitled, We Are Our Mountains, The Geography of Nationalism in the Armenian Self-Determination Movement, nagorno karabakh 1988-1998. He is a frequent contributor to academic journals and policy forums. He's also active in the Armenian American community, uh, having served as the editor of the Boston-based Armenian Weekly, and currently serves as the chairperson of the ARF's Central Committee Eastern Region. Thanks very much, Vache. 
And, uh, oh, I think I'm a little too tall for this. <clears throat> Thank you to the ARF and to Glendale Community College for um, organizing this conference. Uh, my hope is that we'll cover some new ground today. I mean, hopefully we'll, we'll recover some old ground, but let's uh, hope that we can cover new ground uh, towards some new and innovative approaches in bolstering uh, the quest for Barabas' uh, final self-determination. What I thought I would do today uh, is talk about the self-determination issue, uh, where it stood when the movement began formally in 1988, where it has stood during the ensuing 23 years, and where we, where we are today, uh, what approaches are current, what new approaches may be forthcoming uh, in seeking to strengthen our hand at the negotiating table and on the ground. So perhaps the place to start first is to talk uh, for a moment about what we mean by self-determination. Uh, what is it, in fact, that we seek in all of this? Now, speaking amongst ourselves, in-house, uh, it's sort of second nature to treat Karabakh as ours. Karabakh is Armenian. We know that geographically Karabakh forms the southeastern edge of the Armenian plateau. We know that historically it has been populated by Armenians almost exclusively for centuries. We know when we visit the area that there are cultural artifacts, cemeteries, uh, old villages that attest to the Armenian provenance of that region. So it's all, it almost goes without saying for us that Karabakh is Armenian. But internationally, when you have competing claims, when there are others who have different narratives, that I think it's not enough for us simply to point to history and geography. We need to point to the legal foundations of the problems. And what the Armenians have done uh, especially in 1988, is point to the right of national self-determination, which is a, uh, an internationally guaranteed right. Uh, it has legal precedent in various courts. And basically, the right of self-determination says that any people has the right to choose its form of government. Now, what that form of government may be is open to discussion. Some peoples, some nations, may choose autonomy within a larger state system. Others may seek outright independence. The form of government is up to the people themselves, usually based on a referendum. But the right to national self-determination, that any defined people or nation can choose its form of government, self-government, is inscribed within most brands of international law, including the Soviet brand of international law. So the Armenians uh, of Karabakh, as you'll recall, organized themselves in 1988, carried on massive work on the ground, organizing a referendum that featured thousands of signatures of Armenian inhabitants of the region, which at the time was the NKAO, the nagorno karabakh autonomous oblast, which belonged to Soviet Azerbaijan, but had a special status. And as you recall, the Armenians uh, in that referendum pointed to Article 70 of the Soviet Constitution. Article 70 of the Soviet Constitution very firmly guaranteed the rights of peoples to national self-determination. And we built our case on that. Our case was not built uh, in other ways. It wasn't based on Karabakh's right to uh, become independent or join Armenia. It was based very much on the local right of peoples to self-determination. Also, I should add that uh, the Karabakh Armenians at the time were very careful. They did not direct their protests against Moscow. They did not say that the Soviet Union is fundamentally unjust and needs to be dissolved. Uh, at the time, the Armenians were quite careful, not seeking to destabilize, 
not seeking to uh, uh, antagonize Gorbachev and the center, but rather to play within the rules as they had defined them, as uh, Moscow had defined them. Now, of course, we know what happened, and I'm going to fast forward to the map for a moment. It seems you can't really explain things without a map these days. So here is uh, a map of the region centered upon Karabakh. And let's take a moment and look at this, because this will enable the narrative. Uh, if you look in the center of this map, you have a small kidney-shaped structure. That kidney-shaped territory is the NKAO, the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast. And the territories immediately surrounding it in white are the territories of liberated Karabakh. Let me take a moment and explain to you what these territories represent, because it's fundamental to understanding what has transpired. Karabakh historically has consisted of two geographic regions, what we say in Armenian, Lernain Karabakh, Yev Tashtarin Karabakh, mountainous Karabakh, and the Karabakh Plains, or Karabakh Lowlands. Mountainous Karabakh has been populated exclusively by Armenians for many centuries. The Karabakh lowlands were a uh, contested zone that were populated largely by Armenians, but also seasonally were populated by Azerbaijani herdsmen, nomads, if you, were, if you will, who uh, in the wintertime would come down to the plains and in summertime would retreat from the plains elsewhere. There are certain areas of the Karabakh lowlands, for example, most uh, prominent would be Lachi, today's Kashatakh, that has a very distinct Armenian provenance. You go to Lachi, you go to Kashatakh, the cultural artifacts all around you indicate Armenian presence. But there are other areas that featured a mixed population. Now this is very important because these areas uh, were artificially separated from one another by Stalin. As you know, uh, Joseph Stalin supervised uh, territorial horse trading that went on following World War I, and which crystallized in 1923 when the Politburo ratified taking that small kidney-shaped territory and converting it into the NKAO, the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast. That territory was separated, carved away from Armenia, and the intervening territories, for example, the, what we know to be the Lachin Corridor, if you see number one, uh, zone one amongst the numbered areas, now, from number one to number four is the Lachin Corridor area, that connective tissue that ties Karabakh directly to Armenia. Those areas, all of those numbered areas, in fact, were ethnically cleansed, reseeded with Kurdish and later Turkish populations, often by massacre, and basically were de-Armenianized. This is very important because today, uh, most people, certainly the Azeris, refer to Karabakh as the smaller kidney-shaped territory. But in fact, we are looking at an expansive view of Karabakh today. Today's NKR, the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, includes the kidney-shaped territory and these surrounding zones, which in many cases, historically Armenian, but perhaps more importantly today, form the principal guarantor of Karabakh's security. Some call them buffer zones, other call, others call them border regions, we call them liberated territories. Those territories really are the primary guarantor of Karabakh's security. Okay. And uh, the likelihood of hostilities would become all the more without those territories. These are very important uh, considerations. And what I want to add is that, now let's, let's move to the narrative. Uh, what does self-determination mean? In practical terms, self-determination has meant different things at different times. What we saw in 1988 is not necessarily what we seek today. 
What we saw in 1988, the Armenians pursued a legal argument by the book. So in 1988, the Armenians were able to organize a referendum around what? Around the NKAO. That's where Armenians lived. That's where Armenians had a presence. That's where they had legal jurisdiction in a limited sense. So the Armenians of 1988 sought what? They sought the right of the NKAO to secede from Azerbaijan and reunify with Armenia. There was no talk of liberated territories. There was no talk of uh, Lachin, Kelpachar, and the other areas that we know to be Armenian today. Why did, why did things change? What happened? Well, it's not that the Armenians one day decided to become expansionist and said, that's not what happened. What happened is the Azeris went to the casino, as it were. They rolled the dice and they lost. Azerbaijan basically uh, sought to repress the Armenian movement by force. Uh, the Armenian self-determination movement by 1990 had been taken away from the Soviet boardrooms and been replaced on the battlefield. That was not done by Armenian effort. That was done by Azerbaijani efforts to repress and intimidate. And ultimately, as the Soviet Union was falling in 1991, Azerbaijan sought its final solution to its Karabakh problem by beginning a methodical, systematic ethnic cleansing of Karabakh, what we know to be Operation Rain, where entire villages were deported, uh, depopulated, and where Armenians were intimidated, either into leaving or into falling into line with Azerbaijani policies. That process of ethnic cleansing uh, endangered Gharabakh's very security. And I dare say, with all due respect to our Gharabakh brethren, our Gharabakhsi brethren, and their acts of valor, uh, what probably saved the day for us was the demise of the Soviet Union. Because the Armenians faced double domination. They faced, at one level, Republican authority, uh, personified in Baku. And above Baku, they faced central authority in the form of Moscow's uh, interior ministry and other forces that backed up the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. As long as that double domination was around, Armenians faced a very steep uphill climb. But when the Soviet Union fell, the balance was rescaled. I don't want to go into heavy detail. Let me just say that uh, when the Soviet Union fell, Moscow dropped away as a force pro-Azerbaijan and became a more neutral or even at times pro-Armenian factor. Uh, and for that, I think we have uh, the El Shibay regime to thank. For those of you who recall, the first independent regime in Azerbaijan was very strongly Turkic, pro-Turkic, pan-Turkic. And uh, they concerned, they worried the new Russian authorities. And the Russians ended up teaching them a lesson by providing certain kinds of support, logistical and otherwise, to the Armenians. And again, I say none of this to underestimate or demean what we did on the ground. What our people in Armenia and diaspora managed to do for Gharabakh uh, alongside the Gharabakhsis on the ground was nothing short of heroic. But at the same time, we need to factor in these other, uh, other factors or other elements which played a part as well. So back to the point, Azerbaijan rolled the dice and lost. They sought to ethnically cleanse Gharabakh, and when the Soviet Union fell, they failed. Bit by bit, the Armenians were able to chip away at Azerbaijani strongholds. Probably the turning point in the war was the liberation of Shushi in May of 1992, where we took their strategic vantage point, which they used to bombard Stepanakert and surrounding lowlands. After Shushi fell, it was not long before we took Lachin and established direct overland links between Gharabakh and Armenia. And then, over a period of two years, Armenians fanned outward beyond the NKAO's borders driving out all Azeri military and civilian presence. And we drove southward all the way to the Iranian border. We drove northward to the mountains of the Madaf chain, eventually connecting Karabakh to Armenia's back door, that is, the Lake Sevan Basin. 
And we pushed eastward toward Afdal, toward the Azerbaijani lowlands. Okay, and these were done, again, consciously as strategic moves designed to back off Azerbaijani forces and create some, some living space for Gharapah. So this is the dynamic of Gharapah's liberation. So in 1988, we sought a rather restricted view, or had a rather restricted view of self-determination. But today, the NKR sits on an expanded territory that we view as vital towards maintaining Gharabakh's security. So today, when we speak of self-determination for Gharabakh, uh, I think most of us speak of the current NKR, the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, and its extant territories. Now, obviously, self-determination is not the only game in town. It's not the only principle in town. Uh, usually, uh, what states use to head off self-determination movements is to invoke uh, its rival or conflicting principle, and that is the right to territorial sovereignty of states, the right to territorial integrity. Uh, those of you who know the Soviet Constitution know that Article 70 guarantees nations the right to self-determination. When you turn the page in Article 77, guarantees states the right to territorial integrity. So uh, the Soviet Union sort of created a built-in impasse. And uh, this is the case also in international law. Generally, uh, multilateral international bodies will weigh in on the side of states and guaranteeing their stability and their right to, to territorial sovereignty. So this is what Azerbaijan uses today in arguing back, in pushing back, uh, in its negotiations with Armenia and with the international community. Okay, I think I covered this ground, what self-determination meant for Harabakh in 1988 and what it means today. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the territorial horse trading as we move forward. I don't want to spend much time with a geography lesson, but you can see that liberated Gharabakh on this map affords Armenia and Gharabakh some great strategic advantages that we did not enjoy before. You look, for example, at the border with Iran, it has been tripled. You look at the overland connections with Armenia, Gharabakh and Armenia are effectively one. You look to the east and there is perhaps a 15, 20 kilometer stretch of land that separates Armenian populations from the front lines. Generally, uh, across the board, the Azerbaijani army has been distanced from the major centers of Armenian population. On the debit side, yes, we have incurred losses as well. Some of you recall the devastating loss of Shahumya, which is the northernmost area in orange. Uh, which we lost and was depopulated, I believe, in 1991. We also lost small bits of territory in eastern Mardakert, which you see, and eastern Martuni province, which you also see. Okay, let's move forward. So, let's talk about a negotiated solution and what that entails. As you know, the current process is, uh, is supervised by the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is a multilateral institution. The OSCE's MINSK group, uh, headed by three states, France, U.S., and Russia, are supervising these negotiations. Each country has a co-chair, and those co-chairs rotate in taking charge of the overall process. Uh, without going into much detail, let me just say that the OSCE process has been very slow. Uh, tortuous, uh, a winding path in and out, up and down, uh, and that conceivably, in and of itself, could be an advantage for, for either side. Uh, I, who tend to be an optimist, tend to view the glass as half full, uh, I'm perfectly content to see these guys continue for 10, 20, 30 years arguing the finer points of self-determination, autonomy, territorial sovereignty. My view would be, let them continue. Meanwhile, let's use that time window to build our facts on the ground. 
And we'll talk a little bit about what those facts on the ground may be uh, in a few minutes. But in any case, the OSCE process has been slow. It has not yielded any major breakthroughs for either side. Uh, if I had to characterize it broadly, the OSCE process has generally involved a push and pull between Western and Russian interests. Uh, the West, primarily the US, uh, have sought a speedy resolution that would restabilize the region in Azerbaijan's favor. Give Karabakh a high degree of autonomy, but ultimately it needs to be returned to Azerbaijan. Russia has a more uh, interesting and complicated view. Some people think that the Russians are pro-Armenian. Uh, I beg to differ, I don't think they are. But Russian geopolitical interests uh, uh, have created an interesting dynamic. I don't think that Russia is interested in a speedy resolution. They may not be interested in any resolution to the problem. Rather, permanent instability seems to provide Russia with maximum leverage. If Azerbaijan gets out of line, they can threaten them, pressure them, say, watch it, if you don't fall into line, we may tilt towards an unfavorable solution on Karabakh. And they can do the same vis-a-vis -vis Armenia. So for Russia, uh, it seems to be preferable to maintain Karabakh as an open question. Uh, because once it's resolved, in a sense, leverage, a playing card, uh, is lost to them. So you have this sort of vacillation between the US interest for speedy resolution, for restabilizing, and Russia's interest in keeping things hanging. Uh, some would argue that that is changing now because Russia's interests have begun to change in small ways. I think one important factor is Russia's relationship with Turkey. Uh, Russia has traditionally viewed Turkey as an adversary, as a proxy for U.S. interests. Uh, Turkey seeking to extend its influence eastward to Azerbaijan and to Central Asia. But that seems to be changing, partly because Russia is developing its energy policy in the region, and they're trying to court Turkey into various energy agreements. Also, frankly, Turkey uh, has begun to uh, make a little bit of noise vis-a-vis -vis the US. I think we've all seen that. And uh, is trying to move a little bit towards a non-aligned posture. So as a result, Russia may not be viewing Turkey quite the same way as they did in the past. But I think fundamentally, Russia still views the Caucasus as its backyard, and it resists any outside attempts to rescale the balance. Now, what about these negotiations? Um, I would say that uh, the way that Azerbaijan frames the issue and the way that we frame the issue are fundamentally different, and it's important to understand that framing. Azerbaijan continually beats us over the head with the fact that this is an international, interstate conflict. Armenia has initiated an act of aggression against Azerbaijan by taking Karabakh away from it. Armenia is viewed, in a sense, as the bad guy, the black hat that has initiated aggression. So, as far as Azerbaijan is concerned, Armenia is their principal adversary, and Armenia is the one that needs to make concessions. In their view, the Karabakh Armenians are a secondary factor in all of this. They are treated as a minority within Azerbaijani's overall population. They are not treated as a subject in and of themselves. Our view, uh, I would say, certainly the ARF's view, and I think many other political forces would view things as this is not an interstate conflict. Fundamentally, this is a self-determination conflict. Or, if you will, I would say an anti-colonial situation. The Armenians in Karabakh, just as, let's say, the Algerians under French occupation or the Indians under British occupation, were seeking to rid themselves of oppression, seeking to rid themselves of uh, their colonized situation. And they rose up with a freedom struggle based on self-determination. Logically, Armenia came to its aid, and Armenia today is its pr principal source of support. But this is not a, a movement initiated by Armenia. It's a movement initiated indigenously, locally. Now, <clears throat> these, uh, 
these two approaches obviously conflict with one another. Uh, one area that I'm, I'm disappointed in is that Armenia sometimes plays into Azerbaijan's hands on this issue by seeking to hold all the playing cards in its hand during negotiations. Uh, probably the most visible example was uh, the move by Robert Kocharyan when he became president of Armenia to take all of the major negotiating chips and consolidate them in his hand and basically reducing Karabakh and its president, Arkady Fugasyan, to puppets, to figureheads. Uh, Kocharyan, who I happen to admire as a tactician, I think he's often a quite skilled chess master. On this issue, in my view, he, he miscalculated. He said, what's the big deal? I was president of Karabakh, now I'm president of Armenia. I speak for all Armenians, I will, sp I will speak. By Taking that approach, Armenia, in my view, has given away one of our safety valves, one of our negotiating chips, which is to bring Karabakh into the process, give them a seat at the negotiating table, utilize them as a resource. I don't need to go into the ABCs of negotiation to uh, tell you that when you have multiple factors that you can utilize, you can play them off one another. There are good cop, bad cop scenarios, there are uh, doves and hawks, there are different ways of approaching the negotiation that give us flexibility if we choose to use it. Unfortunately, Armenia has not, and by speaking in the name of Karabakh and keeping Karabakh off to the side, in a sense we play into Azerbaijan's hands. Uh, Azerbaijan says it's an interstate conflict, and Armenia seemingly is signaling the same thing. Okay, so this is something that needs to be worked on, needs to be rectified, and there are certain ways that we're, we are working to rectify it. Uh, I should say, and again, I'll, I'll go out a little bit on a limb, uh, I sense that things are changing in the last few years, uh, both in Karabakh and in Armenia. Uh, as someone who has boots on the ground, or at least I have one boot on the ground in Karabakh, uh, there is quite a significant difference uh, between the prior regime headed by Arkady Bulgasyan and the current regime headed by Bako Sahakyan. Both in their pronouncements and their acts on the ground, uh, they are much more uh, firm and bold on demanding Karabakh's seat at the table, and also much more <laughs> firm and bold on the liberated territories, on the absolute essential aspect of those territories for Karabakh's security. Okay. There was a time, I, I must confess to you, the OSCE would send in observers to Karabakh every three or four years. And among their observations, they would go to the liberated territories to see if they could detect settlement activity, which in their view, of course, is illegal and potentially provocative. Um, I can understand Armenia taking a, a cautious uh, attitude towards that. Why should Armenia weigh in on the, liberate, uh, the resettlement of liberated territories? Uh, Armenia, by doing so, can invite outside pressure, unwanted scrutiny. I can understand Armenia being rather cautious, but Karabakh, it's a different matter. The Karabakhsis live there. They have every reason to, to fight and speak up for those liberated territories. And yet the Vulgasian regime, hear no evil, see no evil. They said, resettlement of liberated territories? What resettlement? What liberated territories? They didn't, they didn't play those cards at all. On the contrary, they were timid to the point of reactionary. The Sahakian regime is not that way. Um, for one, uh, the last time the OSC came, uh, the Prime Minister, Araharu Chunyan, held a press conference welcoming the OSCE, wishing them success in their mission, and saying, and by the way, yes, we do have a resettlement project underway in Kashata, in Lachi, uh, which I found to be bold, and at least as far as I can tell, it did not invite any massive uh, countermeasures or counterattacks from the OSCE. Other things as well, you know that by virtue of the Armenia Fund, in the late 90s, we built the Bridge of Life, the 
Laching Corridor Highway that is the vital connecting road tying Harabakh to Armenia. Well, today, with Armenia's blessing, the Harabakh government is building the second road. They are repaving, asphalting the road and turning it into a highway through northern Karabakh, through Kelbajar, to Armenia, through Lake Seban, through Vartanis. Okay, so, and they are actively working on the ground to reintegrate Karabakh into Armenia. They're also electrifying the entire Kashatal region. It is now 100% electrified. They are beginning to do what a government is supposed to do for that region, providing basic infrastructure and necessities for the population. So there are important differences. And I think it, it's fair to say that Karabakh would not do this independently. They probably have uh, some sort of cognizance, or if not blessing, uh, of Armenia in this enterprise. So I view this as welcome steps towards a more bold and proactive policy. Uh, as I was saying earlier, the OSC is giving us time with these tortuous negotiations. Let us use that time. Let us use that time to build our facts on the ground. How am I doing time with? Okay. Okay. Uh, the second area I want to uh, discuss is the NKR's status. Look, these negotiations, what are they revolving around? I think they revolve around several things, but the main issues are two. One is Karabakh's political status. Is it part of Armenia? Is it independent? Is it autonomous within Azerbaijan? What is its degree of autonomy? Obviously, Azerbaijan says nothing short of return of Karabakh to Azerbaijan. Karabakh says no, our independence, there's no turning back. Uh, independence is our goal. So the status issue, of course, is the biggest apple of discord. But the second issue, and we should not underestimate, the second issue is the fate of the liberated territories. Father Aliyev, uh, uh, Haidar Aliyev uh, was a pragmatist and on various occasions Arababyan reminds me uh, both under the table and apparently above the table uh, kind, of hint, kind of hinted that yes we know, we know Arabakh is independent, okay but uh, where he put his foot down is on the liberated territories and that stands to reason because the fate of those liberated territories really guarantee Karabakh's maneuvering room and its ability to be viable as an independent state or as part of Armenia. Now today, I think Azerbaijan is feeling more bold. Part of that is uh, Aliyev the Younger and his, uh, his style. He's a little bit more flamboyant. He's more seat of the pants. Uh, he thinks he can intimidate Armenia with his war, war rhetoric. He's constantly beating the drums. I think he's met his match in Bako Sahakyan. Bako Sahakyan is no uh, uh, shrinking violet when it comes to rhetoric. I think the last time uh, Aliyev said we're going to celebrate next year, uh, we're going to celebrate New Year's in Stepanakert, and uh, Sahakyan said, okay, the next time you try something, we're going to take more land from you. So. Um, I think when you're dealing with obnoxiousness, sometimes obnoxiousness is the way to go in reply. But um, I personally don't believe that Azerbaijan is seeking to restart hostilities. There are various reasons why I believe that. One is that, frankly, the Aliyev regime has it very good. Okay? They are sitting on a lot of money. They are rolling in wealth. Um, they really don't have much of a challenge right now domestically in terms of democracy movements. Uh, they risk a lot by going to war. Uh, war has often served as a catalyst for regime change. You know, a number of regimes, most notably the El Chibay regime, were overthrown because they ended up losing the war and nationalist elements rose up against them. So I think that's one important consideration. Also, let's not forget that the international community is not interested in a restart of hostile. Can you imagine BP and the other investors that have billions invested in the Caspian region countenancing, uh, willingly going along with the restart of hostilities that could destabilize their investment and uh, create a brouhaha? I don't think it's in the cards, at least in the near future. But Azerbaijan continues to rearm. They've invested some of their largesse 
in their military capabilities. They engage in war rhetoric, and we need to deal with that. Well, one way to deal with that is for us to push back with a movement uh, towards the international recognition of the NKR. Uh, this is an initiative that our high top committees, the ANC, are at the forefront of. We've discussed this in detail with the NKR authorities. They agree with us and, frankly, are very pragmatic on this issue. More pragmatic, I would say, than Armenia's authorities. Uh, I remember sitting with Bako Sahakyan in November, and he said, look, obviously, when you make any moves, you better consult with us, but we understand you guys in diaspora, you know how to lobby. That's not our forte. We're, our forte is creating facts on the ground within Kharkov. So we have a willing partner in the NKR authorities, again, with the cognizance of those in Armenia, to develop an international recognition campaign. Now, the first salvo was struck, what, six months ago, eight months ago, when Uruguay's foreign minister issued an announcement indicating his government's readiness to acknowledge Vatapov's independence. There are other similar states around the world that are non-aligned, that may not have direct interests in the Caucasus, that may be ideologically aligned with freedom struggles like ours, so we are now initiating the process of seeking out friendly governments that will hopefully build a movement toward recognition. And we may not ultimately attain recognition of Karabakh, but what we could do in the process is restrain Azerbaijan. Uh, a number of foreign ministries have indicated to us that even if they don't acknowledge Karabakh's independence, they would be willing to go on the record saying, we will acknowledge Karabakh's independence if Azerbaijan restarts hostilities. So this could serve as a restraining mechanism preventing Azerbaijan from considering force. So I think in the coming months and few years you'll see an intensified effort on that front. Let me quickly try to wrap up. As usual, I get caught up in these side discussions. Look, negotiations don't simply happen in the boardroom. They also happen on the ground. Sometimes we forget this. We think sometimes that lobbying is a free-floating endeavor. It's not. Lobbying uses uh, raw material, khamur, that we often create on the ground. The best and biggest thing we can do in creating facts on the ground is to resettle these liberated territories. The liberated territories form an active, populated, economically developed part of Karabakh it will be very hard to undo that. Obviously, the main focus of resettlement has been the Kashatah, formerly Lachin region, as well as Kelbajar, because those are the front lines that connect Karabakh to Armenia. Quite frankly, resettlement efforts on our Armenians' part have been slow, not always efficient. Uh, today, Lachin has no more than 10,000 inhabitants, probably less. Uh, the region could easily hold 50 to 100,000 people. Uh, it could become a breadbasket for not only Karabakh, but for southern Armenia. But it has not been actively developed. I know that the Karabakh government now is becoming more interested in taking a proactive approach. But aside from their efforts and a few NGOs working there, uh, the area is pretty much a no-go area. And I think here is really where the diaspora has to stop step up and play a bigger role in creating those facts on the ground. One other item I want to mention very briefly is PR and publicity work uh, and legal work on behalf of Harabah. Uh, the ex-foreign minister of Harabah, Arman Melikian, uh, initiated a very interesting project about five, six years ago. Uh, it has not taken off the way it should, but it could conceivably become a nice little factor for us. That is, to establish compatriotic unions of Armenians from Azerbaijan. Those of you who read Azerbaijani propaganda, you know how much noise they make about their refugees, their internally displaced persons, about how Armenians committed massacres and drove out Azeri civilians from Karabakh. No one ever mentions the several hundred thousand Armenians who lived in Azerbaijan until the early 90s, who were driven out by massacre, Sumgay, later Baku, 
without any compensation whatsoever. Uh, forget about the lives lost, the properties, the, the wealth, all of it went up in smoke. Okay. Conceivably, Armenians could press claims. I doubt very much Azerbaijan would honor those claims. But Armenia, as part of its PR offensive, could support those sorts of claims, saying that Armenians were an integral part of Azerbaijan and they're not any longer. Who's going to take care of their situation? So some sort of mini reparations drive could serve as a factor that we could utilize at the negotiating table. Azerbaijan talks about these liberated territories. Well, you know, it's interesting. One component of the Armenian population actually is from Azerbaijan that lives today in Lachin and the liberated territories. It could be actually quite interesting to build up a case and say, these people lived in Azerbaijan, they were driven out. Now, these territories, Lachin, Kalpacha, are there just compensation for everything they've lost. So this is something else to consider. Uh, let me just conclude by saying, we often speak of Artsakh as a self-enclosed territory and a self-enclosed problem. But really, if you look at the map, liberated Artsakh today is a cornerstone of Armenia's national security. Not just Karabakh, but Armenia's national security. It creates more defensible borders for us. It potentially creates economic security for Armenia. And as such, should not be viewed as some disposable or side issue for Armenia, or Armenia needing to go to bat for Karabakh. By going to bat for Karabakh, Armenia is going to bat for itself. So I think this is very important for us to bear in mind. The Karabakh cause really belongs to everyone. But of course, if it belongs to everyone, that means everyone must do their part. I dare say we've only begun to scratch the surface. And I hope this conference helps us to go a little bit deeper towards some fundamental solutions. Thank you very much. UCLA and is the assistant director at the UCLA Center for Public Health and Disasters, focusing on the field of emergency public health. She works closely with state and local public health agencies, international health ministries, and federal agencies to increase their emergency preparedness and response capacities for natural disasters, complex human, uh, humanitarian emergencies, and bioterrorist events. Formerly, she was a research associate at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she also received her PhD. Dr. Dodian has been working in Armenia and Vada since 1994. She was invited in 1996 to write Vada first national uh, health plan and was awarded one of the first U.S. government grants for Vada to implement a nationwide primary health care program uh, through the International Committee for the Red Cross. She was the program manager for the newly constructed National Adult uh, Polyclinic and Diagnostic Center in Stepanagia. In 2007, she was granted the Medal of Gratitude by then NPR President Arkady Kuvasyan for contributions to the re uh, reconstruction and development of NKR's national economy, science, culture, social sphere, and healthcare. Dr. Dorian is a senior technical consultant to several non governmental organizations and international research centers including the American Red Cross, the American University of Armenia, the International Medical Corps, and International Relief and Development. Um, while speaking uh, about Karabakh, we oftentimes think about the military and strengthening the military in order to ensure the security of the region. Uh, it's also just as important to discuss the public health of the population in order to ensure its prosperity. Uh, Dr. Dorian, um, her presentation is entitled Health in Nagorno Karabakh, human right or political gain. Let me just take a minute to, by introducing myself, sort of set the stage for today's discussion. 
I have had the fortune, or maybe rather the misfortune, of working in many disasters, especially complex emergencies, uh, wars, and working under extraordinary circumstances. One of my most extraordinary challenges and experiences has been working in Karabakh since 1994. As mentioned, uh, thank you, I sounded great on paper, um, I've had the honor of writing its first national health plan in 1996. I want to frame this discussion today first talking generally about how the international community responds to such complex emergencies everywhere in the world and what mandates it's driven by. And then I want to talk about the differences that we experienced when we were responding in Gharaba and how those differences still continue today and really shape the development, especially of the healthcare sphere, that sector in Gharaba continuously. Um, I want you to all sort of imagine that primary approach that was taken by the international community right when ceasefire was enacted in 1994. From then until now, there's been this continued, sustained lack of international support. As we know, lack of recognition, lack of international involvement, which has really shaped Gharabah and unfortunately shaped the health sector and not necessarily in a good way. It has directly or maybe indirectly and unknowingly or perhaps knowingly hampered the development of the country's population, the health of our population, the development where the basis of an entire nation is the population. As you all know, if you don't have a healthy population, you don't have a nation. So I want you to understand the importance of health today. So sort of thinking about it in two ways. The importance of health, as we all know, without health, we have nothing. Understanding the importance of health on a population. Understanding that health is considered a human right internationally. When we respond to disasters, health is a human right. And then understanding how that human right can be used as a political force or a political power, which is used to direct the rate and the direction of the development of a nation. I also want you then to sort of pull away and just use my talk, because it's focusing on health, really as just a case study, an illustration of where we are today and the difficulties and challenges that we have been facing on this road of self-determination and statehood. And it's very important to keep this in mind because we can talk about policy, politics, this entire overarching umbrella, but the reality is we have to concentrate on the daily existence in Gharabah. How does this impact the daily struggles in Gharabagh, the health sector in Gharabagh, the education sector in Gharabagh, the economy of Gharabagh? Because after all, all of that is what shapes a nation. So just really quickly, um, what do we do with humanitarian response? Basically, what we have to do is figure out how to gain access to the populations that we're working in. This is what I do every time a disaster strikes, whether it's a natural disaster or a conflict. We do have internationally this humanitarian imperative where we feel it is our responsibility to enter into a situation to provide assistance. However, as much as we want to go, we don't have the right until we are actually asked in or invited into a country. But we usually don't give up until we go in. And we've seen that recently with Sri Lanka, we saw it in Kosovo. We were actually in Macedonia waiting for the Kosovar Albanians to cross, even though we weren't necessarily invited in at that point. So sort of thinking about all of these issues. We also work with governments to align their programming to national standards. Keep this in mind when we talk about the de facto government of Harabal and what that actually means. And then obviously the point is to build capacity and empower. The point is not for us to stay there. The point is to make sure that the population stands on its own two feet and creates a healthcare sector or water or education that's appropriate for its culture and its people. So who are the players usually? The United Nations with all of its different bodies, especially the UNHCR, High Commissioner for Refugees, UNICEF, the Organization for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, etc., national governments, the Red Cross movement, both with the ICRC, IFRC. The IFRC is the International Federation for the Red Cross. They're usually involved more with uh, natural disasters, whereas the ICRC that we've all seen is usually with complex emergencies. 
and then NGOs and implementing partners on the ground. The UN always takes the lead. In every disaster I've ever been to, the United Nations is the overarching umbrella that guides every other operating agency that's in there. Obviously, they are working hand in hand with the government. Our responses are divided into clusters. Each one of those clusters has groups of people working just for that sector. So when I arrived in Haiti, there were probably over 150 groups on the ground right after, within that two week period, working on all of these sectors. Okay, one more thing I want to say. With health, the lead is the WHO, the World Health Organization. And this is the mandate that we go by. WHO states that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Basically, the idea is it's looking at the totality of healthness, healthfulness, okay? And we, whenever we respond, must go in in order to establish this totality. So it's not a doctor providing health care. It's making sure everything, water, sanitation, health, health care, infection control, all of these things fall under this umbrella. In 1946, the Constitution of the World Health Organization basically, here's where it defines health as a fundamental right of every human being, without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social conditions. Again, whenever we walk into any situation, this is the sort of the, the legal mandate we walk into with. We believe the international uh, community has all signed off, ratified as states on this, that this is the way we move forward. And in 1981, they came up with the Health for All strategy. And basically the Health for All strategy again says that essential health care, primary health care basically, is accessible to everybody. There have been many other mandates past uh, 1994, but I wanted to tell you the two main ones that I would walk into Harabah utilizing when I went in. So again, health is considered a human right. Human rights are interdependent, indivisible, and interrelated. And basically what we state when we go in is that violating the right to human health is a violation of human rights, and the violation of other human rights, such as the right to food, the right to water, to an adequate standard of living, adequate housing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, this is the umbrella. These are the glasses we wear when we walk into a situation. What happened in Karabakh? In 1994, as Antoni noted, remember the, the way the map was sort of set up. We had no international assistance whatsoever. We also had a very difficult time with defining the population and our needs to the international community. These two terms, refugee and internally displaced, you can't swap them. They have very distinct meanings and they have very distinct international laws that are attached to each one of these groups. A refugee is somebody who crosses an international border. Internally displaced remains within the confines of their, their uh, territory. So what were we in Harabakh to the international community? Were they refugees? Were they internally displaced? Did they cross an international border? Because UNHCR has a clear mandate that all refugees fall under UNHCR and they will take action. But we couldn't define what we were. Which also brings us to a host country. Host country means refugees cross the border and come into a host country. Host country gets different assistance from these international agencies. Is Gharaba a host country? But when in Stepanakert, for seven months, the capital of Harabakh was bombed, was under direct attack, is that then a host country? So these terms meant a lot to us, and we didn't know how to clarify them in order to make sure that the international organizations would respond. The other problem we had was a huge flight from violence. Flight for violence, war, frozen conflict, all of these need much greater assistance than dealing with a natural disaster. Obviously, we all had the 1988 natural disaster of Armenia in our minds, not that we don't need a lot of assistance for that, but usually the way it works is that should be a, lot, a smaller uh, period of time before it moves into redevelopment. With war, 
with complex, uh, complex emergencies, the need is greater because they've lost everything. They've given up everything to be there. Not only the physical, but the psychosocial, as well as infrastructure and everything else we had to think about. At that point in time in Karabakh as well, there were no systems to support the government. Which system? Originally, all of Karabakh got its information, we're talking about healthcare specifically, from Baku. The indicators of what they needed to look at, the per capita, uh, how many doctors they needed, how many nurses they needed, everything came centrally from Baku. Resources came from Baku. But now, we had cut, cut those ties completely. And we didn't have the ties for Moscow either with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So our Ministry of Health, the de facto Ministry of Health, had no training as a Ministry of Health. They were doctors, they were surgeons, they were pediatricians, that all of a sudden had to run a health sector of a country not recognized and a country that received zero international assistance. So in 1994, when we started to try to figure out how we were going to write the National Health Plan and realized that we would have no UN assistance, no WHO technical assistance, we also realized we had no data. Gharabagh really didn't know what the problems of Gharabagh were at that point in time because data was centralized. Data was lost during the war. All our buildings were bombed. We had lost a lot of what we had for healthcare. And the reality is, if you ask a physician what they need for their health care, it's completely different than what, if you ask the public health practitioner what they need for their health care system. And we had to get go in and out and think about those things as we started to establish the National Health Care Plan. Again, I have never, in all of my years of responding to disasters, never been left without UN assistance. Never been left without CDC assistance. National CDC actually sends teams over. When I went into Haiti, you all must remember, the US military was actually mobilized to help in Haiti with logistics and everything we did. Here we were in our new country and had zero international assistance or aid at that point. Does that mean that there weren't smaller groups working there? Yeah. There was an NGO from the UK doing a small immunization project. MSF was in there doing a TB program. A few very specialized things. And of course, the diaspora. Really, that's all we had. I was the only expat from America working in Garabal at that time in healthcare. And that was a huge, uh, I guess, weight on my shoulders and obviously a huge honor. But it was a very unique situation when it came to understanding how we could actually plan for what we needed to do next. So the reality is, without health, there is no existence. This conversation today is moot. If you don't have a healthy population, you don't have a nation. It is the prerequisite for nation building. It is the prerequisite for national security. We talk about economy. We talk about repatriating the lands. We talk about productivity. That all depends on a healthy population. In 1996, when we wrote that first national health plan, as I stated, I realized we had no data. And as much as we talk today about collecting data on the ground, when it comes to healthcare, we still don't have the data that we actually need because of funding, because of resources. So what did we do? We conducted the first cross-country population-wide survey ever in Harabah. In 1996, we used 31 university students, the best help you can find anywhere, who were quite excited about even finding out about their country and figuring out what was happening in Harabah. And we did a thousand household survey. That is a large sample size for Harabah. And that is what we based our entire health plan on. We, figured, we had to figure out what the nutritional status was of the population. We didn't even know the demographics at that time. There is such a thing as a population pyramid. You need to know male, female. You need to know a breakdown by age. You need to understand where your population is. We didn't have that. We had to reconstruct it for our population. And that's how we found out basically how much our 
productive age males were decreased in our population due to war, due to landmines, and all of these other issues. You plan differently for that kind of a scenario in the population. We found out that we actually had a lot of nutritional problems. Today in Gharabah, we have increased stunting, shorter, smaller people. And the other extreme, we have increased obesity. Those two things in this population may sound like, because we're in America and we hear these indicators, oh yeah, okay, not a big deal. They're a huge deal on the productivity of a country, on national security. If 30% of your population becomes stunted and another 20% of your population is obese, not only will they have additional and secondary problems, including functioning, uh, mental functioning, cognitive functioning for stunted children, we know that there is a decrease in that, there's a direct correlation. So now we're talking almost 50% of the population having just one nutritional or health problem that could lead to all of these complications when we talk about planning. Not to mention the additional drain that they may be on the population and the healthcare services along the way. So, obviously we found out that we had inadequate quantity of water, poor quality of water, poor sanitation. The other huge problem which we're dealing with today, there's a thing called an epidemiologic transition. When we look at developed countries, we go through this transition where we go from infectious diseases to chronic diseases. So we know here in America, our biggest problems are not infectious diseases. We're not dying from diarrheas and acute respiratory infections. We're dying from chronic diseases. So we see that transition. In Gharabagh, the problem was over the years, the transition, instead of going towards just chronic diseases, came all the way back again. People in Gharabagh were dying from diarrhea. They were dying from dysentery. They were dying from infectious diseases that are regularly controlled in many of these developing countries but we didn't have the data to be able to actually act upon it early enough. Poor, destroyed, and overwhelmed health services, which we know infrastructure completely destroyed. The hospital was not usable whatsoever in Harabagh. Don't forget, Harabagh is not Armenia. If you've been there, Stepan Akert has one hospital. Where are they supposed to go for health care? There's one polyclinic, one for children, one for adults. There's one maternity hospital. Okay, so there's no redundancy built in. We also have a lack of healthcare personnel. It's not like Armenia again. So while we make distinctions and say we should do what Armenia does, there are differences. In Armenia, we have a lot of doctors, medical personnel, because we have an, a medical university and they you know, go through in Armenia and we actually have too many in some ways when it comes to planning. Our mid-level personnel is not enough. In Gharabagh, we don't have that. And we're seeing less and less of it now because of sort of the, the desire to leave and to go to more urbanized areas rather than to stay in Gharabagh. Why should that newly graduated medical doctor stay in Gharabagh? What's the incentive? What's the reason? So we only had two or three cardiologists in the whole country. Two endocrinologists. I mean, we're not talking big numbers. So that's a big thing when you come to planning and redundancy. The other issue we had was uh, cropping up of new diseases such as malaria. We didn't have malaria before. Parts of Azerbaijan had malaria, but in Harabal we didn't. And all of a sudden we saw malaria cropping up and we have no natural immunity to malaria, which is a big problem that we faced as well. So what happened? Um, I would say in some ways, as much as I'm talking about the lack of international exposure and help, it was kind of a blessing in disguise for us, for the Gharabakhti, I call myself the Gharabakhti. Uh, we had the opportunity to stand on our own two feet. Nobody told us how we were gonna create our healthcare system. Not even dollars directed, donor dollars directed us. We had the chance to build it with the way that it was appropriate based on the resources we had, so that it would be sustainable so that we could continue to do what we were doing and have a plan to move forward. Um, one of the other main things, and I'll talk about it coming back, I missed to tell you again, when we talked about data, there's such a thing called a demographic and health survey. It's sort of the gold standard of international surveys. It's done all over the world. 
Western states, developed states, also use surveys very close to demographic and health surveys, but they call it something else. Like California has their interview health survey, et cetera, et cetera. The demographic health survey is the baseline, is the cornerstone of building a healthcare program for a country. So Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Gharabov at this point in time, when we were doing all of this, Armenia in the year 2000 had the first demographic and health survey done. It's had one done again in 2005. These are multi-million dollar surveys internationally done so that we know how to plan. And they also allow international standards so you can compare where the countries are globally. In 2010, Armenia had another demographic and health survey done. Azerbaijan, same thing, 2001, 2006, and now they're undergoing their third demographic and health survey. Gharabov, zero. And the only survey ever conducted was the one we did in 1996. We haven't had a chance to be able to go back and do this cross-sectional survey, which is the baseline, the cornerstone of public health programming. So after all of the lobbying that we were able to do here, finally, in trying to receive assistance for Gharabov, in 1998, based on all of your work and our work here, we finally received the first USAID grant to come to Gharabov. But it was entitled, The Grant to the Victims of the Nagorno-Gharabov Conflict. So for those of you, some of you may know this story, but it was about $12 million or so. When we actually started getting the money, we got about $8 million to the programming in Gharabov for health, for water sanitation, for education, and a few other infrastructural needs. And of course, we were like, what do you mean $8 million? What happened to the other four million that was promised to us? And they said, no, it wasn't promised to you. It was promised to the victims of the nagorno karabakh conflict, which meant the other four million went to Azerbaijan as victims of the conflict, okay? I received money to do the healthcare component. I was told I was only allowed to do emergency humanitarian programming. Well, at this point in time in 1998, that's perfectly fine. It's perfectly correct. But I cannot do any programming that would develop a country. Any development programming could not be funded through AID. And I was not allowed to work with the de facto government. Now remember that first slide. It is a tenant of international humanitarian work and international development that you must work with the local government. You're just a tool helping them craft what is needed, their national standards. According to our grant, we weren't even allowed to work with them. And we basically had to have secretive meetings to really find out what was happening. So in, we were able to do this primary healthcare programming and um, which is emergency public health anyway. It's also basic uh, medical care. So we really focused on primary health care. In 2003, when the grant ran out, USAID came up with another RFP, which means Request for Proposal. And they said it once again, we would give you money for the different sectors, including health. Please apply. We applied. The name was Humanitarian Assistance to nagorno karabakh Hank. That was the name of the grant. It was a five-year grant, again, multi-sector. And they, uh, when we got our uh, proposal back, lucky for us, they didn't fully reject us, but they said, absolutely not, because the programming that you are basically putting forth is development programming. 2003 is practically 10 years since ceasefire. Passing out blankets is absolutely not what the government needs at this point in time. However, AID would not allow us. And you know what was considered development programming at that time? Primary health care is in rural areas mostly. Health posts, where you have one health care worker, perhaps a nurse assisting, and you do primary health care. Sort of what your GP's office would do, or your internist would do. But the reality is, once your GP or your internist can only do so much, they must refer you to the next level of health care. The next level of health care in Armenia and Harabal is that outpatient clinic, the polyclinic, which is called secondary care. And then it goes up to tertiary care, to the hospital level. 
But that's a normal progression of a sick human being. We were not allowed to work on that secondary level of healthcare. So even though for the last five years we had done all of our work on the primary level and then to get ready to move them to the secondary level, we were now not allowed to use this money. And it was a few million dollars that had to basically be wasted in some ways. We found a way, you know, making this sound like it was an emergency, this was this, etc. But that's not the point. The point is, even the money that we fought and lobbied to get, had our hands tied. We were not allowed to use it the way Harabah needed it to be used. So where does this all come? When we're in the field working, the biggest thing we look for is non-discrimination, obviously. And discrimination is really this purpose of impairing or nullifying uh, your right to exercise your human rights and your fundamental freedoms. And that's exactly what we were faced with with our population. Harabah was completely discriminated against in the world market international community. We were marginalized. We also know that in health, marginalized populations disproportionately have a higher share of health issues, health problems. Was this done purposely? Were we marginalized purposely in order for the health of the population to not be able to keep up with the development of the population or what was expected? And these are huge issues that we have to think about. Since 2008, there has been no direct funding for health in AID. No large scale health programs, nothing. AID has been doing some great work in giving us money for Halo Trust. If you don't know, Halo Trust is the demining group that's working in Harabah. We definitely need demining. Uh, the last I, when I spoke to the group on the ground at Halo Trust, they estimated about 100,000 landmines in Harabah. That's almost one per capita. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done for demining. However, for AID and the money that we get, is that the priority? Healthcare is not a priority. Water sanitation is not a priority. Education is not a priority. Empowerment is not a priority. Is demining not important? No, it's important. But it's definitely not our priority in building a country. Again, 18 years post-disaster, how many blankets can you pass out? How many times do they want us to do just, you know, uh, emergency programming? How many band-aids do we put on this solution? We can't. The diaspora has been the leader in helping Harabah, even in healthcare, even in all of those sectors. We cannot do it alone. It's an entire country that we're trying to develop and build. International recognition is key for us to receive international assistance, for us to be able to develop with international standards. And we talk about war again. I mean, the population is not ready, is not ready by any means of the imagination, but how does that affect, again, the way we're trying to, to look into and talk about international recognition, as Antranik sort of stated. So quickly, to just wrap up, um, in, B on, in BBC there was this article about Khojali anniversary and how tens of thousands of people were in Baku and Istanbul and Ankara and out there protesting. And they talk about the last bullet, which is the flood of displaced people has led to a humanitarian crisis with which Azerbaijan is still struggling. This is exactly to the point that Andranik made. 20 years post-disaster, all Azeris in uh, Azerbaijan live in refugee camps. They have not been resettled. If you walk into Harabah, you will not know who's a refugee. You will not know who's an IDP. You will not know who's always been in Harabah. We are completely integrated. If you go to Azerbaijan, they are purposely kept in these camps. They are purposely kept because they want to send that message. By the way, it's deplorable conditions. They live in squalor. But it's done to prove a point. Because in the international community's eyes, this is what they see the refugee camps in Azerbaijan. And that is their bargaining chip, a 
especially when it comes to the international community and the laws that protect them. So, my last slide, I really want to talk about what I feel are the vital next steps for Harabal. Definitely, everything that we've talked about and will continue to talk about on a political realm, but what I really want to talk about is the everyday world of developing a country. The sectors that need to be strengthened, and we can't do it without data. It's not willy-nilly. It's not what we feel. We don't go by our gut. There are scientific processes that need to be put in place in Harabov so that we can make the right decisions for our people. We need to prioritize program. It's not just, oh, I have an interest in doing X, Y, and Z. We need to come down and have a plan, and everybody needs to focus in on that plan. Put our interests together so that we're truly building a nation. We have to direct funding. We need to tell AID where the money should go. Not AID tell us where the money should go. We need to tell them, great, Halo Trust, that is completely their easy way out. Because anybody that you say it to will say, of course, do you mind me? How important is that? But when it's uh, because of or in place of everything else that we need, it's absolutely wrong. And we need to be able to direct that kind of programming. Disaster programs always feed into development programs everywhere in the world. Right now in Haiti, everything that we're doing is programming for Haiti five, 20 years down the road. It's not just to put the Band-Aid there. But our efforts are not moving in that direction. And we may have to make sure they are. And obviously the most important thing is we need to be visible. We need to be loud and we have to be persistent and consistent and what we're asking for in the development of Harapah. Thank you.